And welcome back for the third segment of our conference, the Merle Jordan Conference. What we're going to do right now is uh, have our final presenter, David Wallen, followed by two respondents. We'll finish that segment around 3.30, after which uh, Dr. Merle Jordan himself will come up and offer closing remarks for the conference. Then, when everyone is finished speaking, those of you who are collecting CEs for the conference can complete your evaluations and get your paperwork completed outside. So, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. David Wallen, who's come to us all the way from California in a, in a whirlwind sort of way, and so we appreciate the effort he's put in to be here. Um, he is a clinical psychologist in private practice in Albany and Mill Valley, California, a magna cum laude graduate of Harvard College, so he does have some Boston connections who received his doctorate from the Wright Institute in Berkeley. He's been practicing, teaching, and writing about psychotherapy for nearly three decades. His most recent book, Attachment in Psychotherapy, a book that is in common use, uh, not only at the Danielson Institute, but really across the nation and across the world, is presently being translated into nine languages. He's also co-author with Stephen Goldbart of Mapping the Terrain of the Heart, Passion, Tenderness, and the Capacity to Love. He has lectured on attachment and psychotherapy in Australia, Europe, Canada, and throughout the United States, and we are thrilled to have him now here at the Merle Jordan Conference at Boston University. Welcome, David. So thank you. Uh... Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Excellent, okay. Um, so, thank you Danielson Institute. I mean, it's, uh, the whole thing has been, it's, a, it's an honor, it's a pleasure. Uh, you know, the uh, staff, George Stavros, uh, at the head of the staff, or so it seems to me, has been just terrific. And um, thank you Merle Jordan. And uh, anyway, thanks everybody for coming. So here, here we go, uh, a journey into the, uh, well, we could think of this as, as I title it, it's a therapist's psycho-spiritual autobiography with clinical implications. Indeed, okay. Uh, Kenneth Parm Pargament's book, Spiritually Integrated Psychotherapy, visible to my patients as it sat on the table beside the chair in my office, proved an initially unexpected catalyst for a number of conversations. One patient inquired about the source of my interest in the book, which eventually led me to let her in on the conference that was the occasion for both my reading and the writing I was about to do. She asked for details. What's the conference called? You know, if I wanted to find it on the internet. When I told her the skillful soul of the psychotherapist. She paused for a second, looked at me quizzically, and then with a barely suppressed but friendly laugh, half asked, half exclaimed, wow, isn't that a kind of a tall order for the shrink? <laughs> so Nancy uh, and Salman and I were asked to write spiritual autobiographies to illuminate how our sense of the extraordinary informs our work with the ordinary. Searching for the form of my own account, which involves Buddhist mindfulness grafted onto a Jewish identity, I'm aware of my internal conflict between the writer who wants to tell stories and the scholar who wants to refer to books like Pargaments. Put differently, I'm struggling with the legacy of growing up in my particular Jewish family, in which the psychic inheritance could be summed up in three words, suffer, study, succeed. I'll have more to say about this maxim later, but because today's assignment is explicitly personal, I will begin with a story. I was six or seven, and we'd arrived the day before on a trip from California to Canada, Winnipeg actually, to visit my father's father, whom we called Zeta. It was dinner time now, and my parents, my twin brother and I, were seated with various relatives around a large table, at one end of which sat Zeta stern and intimidating 
a patriarch's patriarch whom I never recall seeing without a yarmulke on his head, an Orthodox Jew who spoke with a pronounced Eastern European accent, he had an exacting set of rules and expectations related to being Jewish, but their precise nature was a mystery to me, and thus I was always afraid I might say the wrong thing. At dinner that night, Zeta broke the ice by asking me what I'd eaten for lunch when we were out with Auntie Lena, the family's designation for the handsome and dignified woman he had married after my father's mother's death. My nervousness in Zeta's presence clouded my memory. I could picture the restaurant where we'd had lunch, but what had I eaten? Then, happily, an image arose in my mind's eye, and with relief, I was able to recall and announce that for lunch, I'd had a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. <laughs> of course, at this moment, the room went silent. The earth stood still as a dark cloud of incredulous rage formed around Zeta's head. And then he spoke. What did you say, David? I was speechless, but Auntie Lena calmly answered for me. Dear, he said, he had a bagel, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. <laughs> With these words, life as we'd previously known it could resume. The fact is that life as a child in Zeta's presence was entirely discontinuous with life as I ordinarily knew it. When with Zeta, life was a minefield of potential missteps related to being Jewish in the orthodox religious sense. It was all about going to shul, learning to daven, keeping kosher, keeping the rules. By contrast, my ordinary life meant growing up with parents who had largely left the religion of the Jews behind them, except one with Zeta, where I sensed we were expected to pretend that at home, too, we hewed to an orthodox way of life. All the while, my parents held on to what it meant to be Jewish in the cultural sense that suggested answers to questions like these. What is ultimately important? Who are you in the world? What does it mean to be part of a people, like many other peoples, uh, that has been the object of vicious, in fact, murderous persecution? What, in a life well lived, is the place of suffering, study, and success? Maybe study and success are the solutions to suffering, that and Jewish humor. The injunction to succeed seems built into the, uh, into the culture, as in my son or daughter, the doctor, and what I'm prepared to call the tyranny of nachas, the parents' self-referential satisfaction in the success of their children. As for, t as for study, that too seems virtually inherent in the culture. My own father's bookshelves were lined with Freud and Marx, Havelock Ellis, and Margaret Mead. He told me proudly that when in college, he and a group of intellectually ambitious friends tried to produce, or maybe they just imagined producing, their own encyclopedia of all the relevant knowledge of the time. <laughs> Had they not been rebellious, they might have been students of the Talmud and the Mishnah. Not tangentially, a psychiatrist friend once said to me, the body is for the goyim. But let's cut to the chase, suffering. Two anecdotes. After dinner with a Jewish friend in Boston, Libby Shapiro, with whom I shared the three S's, I received her email in which she agreed with my formulation but suggest, uh, suggested that after the injunction to suffer, I need to add in parentheses, but not silently. <laughs> a couple of days later, I was teaching in Minneapolis, and a therapist in attendance also endorsed it, noting that his mother shared my understanding. A Holocaust survivor, her own maxim was, life is war. I'm sure the centrality of suffering in my own life, psyche, and career choice has roots that are primarily psychological. Yet the psychological and religious cultural influences can intertwine and reinforce each other, or Maybe the latter provide metaphors through which some of the meanings of formative psychological experiences are expressed. The year I was to be bar mitzvahed, my father's sabbatical from Stanford brought our family to London. In Zeta's geography, this was next door to Israel, and so he arranged for my twin brother and me to have our bar mitzvah at an Orthodox shul in Jerusalem. The year was 1961. This was Israel's bar mitzvah, as well as our own. It was also the year of the trial of right. So the trial of Adolf Eichmann. 
for 10 days, for 10 days, For 10 days, we stayed at the King David Hotel, along with journalists from around the world. And every day over breakfast, as I recall, I would read the Jerusalem Post, which seemed filled front to back with highly detailed first-person accounts of horrific suffering, documenting Eichmann's role in the final solution were stories from survivors of Auschwitz, Dachau, Bergen, Belsen, Treblinka, who told of systematic torture and starvation, scientifically engineered extermination, and medical experimentation. I did not want to read what I was reading, but couldn't or wouldn't stop. I wanted to withdraw from the horror, but felt compelled to know it. This was what the survivors had endured. I somehow felt I owed it to them to register their suffering in my mind, in myself. For many years thereafter, I was regularly visited. This is quite unexpected. I, I didn't anticipate the, uh, the feelings. Maybe I should have. Uh, so for many years thereafter, I was regularly visited by unbidden and unwanted images of this suffering, often imagining that I too was a helpless victim of excruciating torture. Though these dreaded waking nightmares had to have been in some sense self-generated, I felt I had no alternative but to submit to them, to suffer. When I described this compulsive suffering to the therapist I saw when I was in graduate school, he suggested that I needed to become more comfortable in the role of the torturers, the guards, rather than always agree to play the part of victim, prisoner, concentration camp, inmate. I simply felt I had no choice. He suggested, too, that the concentration camp was a metaphor that represented the most troubling aspects, uh, some of the most troubling aspects of, of my experience of my family. As I write this, it occurs to me that the analyst Stephen Seligman has proposed that our fantasies provide one more royal road to our, quote, implicit relational knowing, unquote. Our non-conscious, uh, that's a, a phrase uh, borrowed from Carl and Lyons Ruth at, at Harvard, uh, implicit relational knowing, our non-conscious procedural sense of ourselves in relation to others. I'll have more to say about this later, but my masochistic, you know, in quotes, fantasies did indeed reflect an aspect of my sense of myself in relation to others. My sense was that I could bear to suffer in a way that other family members could not, and that my suffering served to, served somehow, it served, no, it served, my suffering served or protected them. And somehow this dovetailed with my sense of myself as a Jewish boy and young man. As a teenager, I experienced a frightening and grandiose identification with the character at the center of Andre Schwartzbart's overwhelming novel of the Holocaust, The Last of the Just, a book I found too painful to finish. The novel's pre uh, premise has a long history in Judaism. God has arranged the world so that there exist among the Jews in each generation 36 just men, or as they're called, Lamed Vavniks, so named because Lamed and Vav are the Hebrew letters corresponding to the number 36, their role is to take on the suffering and pain of all. The young character with whom in a very disturbing way I identified was one of these Lamed Vovniks, whose nobility and compassion in the face of suffering, whose acceptance of the most extreme suffering somehow keeps the world in moral balance. This idea that my suffering was a necessary service to others was entirely, hey, look at the way I just, uh, I suffered a moment ago. Um, the idea that my suffering was a necessary service to others was entirely consistent with my parents' secular Judaism that, was, Judaism that was really a kind of religion of man, of humankind. It was the social justice form of Judaism, in my father's case, the communist version. This take on the religion was expressed in my own political activism and theirs, as well as the fact that Passover, a holiday celebrating liberation from slavery, was my favorite Jewish holiday. 
That my parents were secular Jews is probably one reason I could never, quote, believe in God, unquote. More importantly, perhaps, because my mother was frightening to me and, I believe, because she found my, you know, infantile need for her disgusting, I grew up without a sense that I could depend on another, that I could cry for help, that there was someone who would see, hear, and helpfully respond. So how could I believe in God? I never could. I heard a somewhat different story from a friend of mine who grew up in Argentina where he attended a boarding school with other Jewish kids, but also the kids of Nazis who had fled Germany after Hitler's defeat. My friend had doubts about the existence of a God who would allow such monumental suffering to be imposed upon his own or any other people. But he still had a shred of belief or hope that compelled him of a midnight to sneak out of his own room and into the room that held the ark that held the Torah and to piss on it as a provocation to God so that God might show him a sign. But God did not. And that, my friend told me, was the end of that, putting his quest to rest, sealing his disbelief. My own story of growing up Jewish magnetized suffering, both my sense of being beleaguered and besieged myself and my compulsion to experience through identification and thus to somehow assuage the suffering of others. Doubtless, much of this history is personal, but for God's chosen people, chosen for an exceptional dose of suffering, there are probably elements also of a culture-wide PTSD, a centuries-long intergeneration, intergenerational transmission of trauma that predisposes many of us to identify too readily with the role of victim as well, perhaps, as the roles of victimizer and rescuer. As I'll shortly explain, such identifications have both complicated and facilitated my work as a therapist. In particular, my efforts to be of help to my patients through allowing, understanding, and thus eventually diminishing their suffering. But first, the second, the second chapter of my spiritual autobiography, Counterposed to my own personal, psychological, and or cultural, religious, Jewish drift toward suffering is the suggestion of the Vietnamese Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh to, quote, enjoy, unquote. The latter is part of a developing spiritual orientation of mine, which grew out of a single transformative experience that is easier to talk about than it is to write about. Talking makes more room for the informality and humorously ironic distance that can keep an account of what feels like an extraordinary and moving experience from seeming, from seeming self-aggrandizing or crazy. In any case, the experience in question arose unbidden and unexpectedly during a period in which I was writing a book on attachment theory and psychotherapy. More specifically, I was thinking about the ideas of Peter Fonagy, one of the giants in the attachment field, I was sitting on the deck of my home in Berkeley on a warm and sunny afternoon when a visual image came to mind that seemed to capture some of Fonagy's ideas. The image consisted of three concentric circles. The outermost circle represented external reality, what happens to us. A second circle within represented the internal world of mental models through which we take in, as through a filter, what happens to us. And within the, outer, the two outer circles was a third, which represented what Fonagy calls the reflective self, that part of the personality capable of reflecting on the relationship between our internal world and external reality. As I considered this image of three concentric circles, it occurred to me to ask what seemed the logical, even inevitable question, exactly who is it that is doing the reflecting here? And as I asked myself the question, I did indeed get an answer, not in words or concepts, but in the form of an utterly compelling experience. I felt my ordinary sense of self implode, collapse, reduce to virtually nothing at all but a spark of consciousness. A moment before, the subjective center of me had been my usual self, a dense construct of history, identity, feeling, purpose, taking up a lot of mental space, now at the center was simply awareness that seemed 
to take up no space at all. Suddenly, it seemed obvious and undeniable that the answer to my question, who's doing the reflecting here? You know, or for example, or who's doing the talking here? Who's, do, you know, who's doing the listening? That the answer to my question was no one. That is, no personal self, but only impersonal awareness. Along with this newly discovered sense of self or no self came profound feelings of well-being and gratitude. For a couple of weeks or so, I could call up this new state of mind and the feelings associated with it virtually at will. During this time, I experienced diminished defensiveness, a heightened capacity for empathy and acceptance, and a much intensified connection to others on the basis of what I felt we shared at the core of ourselves. There was also the sense that I had accidentally bumped up against something of great importance. And having stumbled upon what seemed a crucial fact of life, which I'd previously been completely ignorant of, I couldn't stop talking about it. I, I still talk about it. You know, don't get me started. Um, <laughs> I couldn't stop talking about it. This altogether compelling awareness of awareness itself, rather than the internal or external objects we're ordinarily aware of. I remember sitting in a cafe down the street from my office, conversing with a psychologist friend who told me that my account of my experience on the deck called to mind the views of his own spiritual teacher. In the world, according to Ramana Maharshi, he said, what I was talking about was God. The universal self or non-self that is one with the divine. No scholar of Hindu mysticism, I couldn't even tentatively vouch for this interpretation until I went online and found a phrase that described how in the Vedantic tradition, God, Brahman, and the self, Atman, are one. This identity, is, this identity is understood as an, quote, objectless consciousness, awareness, non-dualistically self-aware. And didn't that describe my experience to a T? Short of discussions of God, I repeatedly found that the friends and colleagues who resonated with what I was trying to put into words were those who meditated or who had a spiritual path of one sort or another. Through conversations like these, and dismayed that my transformative experience, once effortly accessible to relive, was now gradually fading into memory, I came to the whole matter of mindfulness and to meditation. Mindfulness, like psychotherapy itself, must be experienced to be known. And meditation, I came to understand, is a practice that exercises the muscle, as it were, that allows us to be mindful. That is, deliberately and fully present for and aware of whatever arises in the immediacy of the moment. As for my own experience of, you know, quote unquote, no self, or should I say, quote, no self, unquote, uh, it was one I can't resist describing, I mean, this is kind of trite and vulgar, but mindfulness on steroids. And so I began to meditate, initially with the hope of bringing back that experience, which had first shown up like an uninvited guest, a guest who turned out to be a beloved friend who soon departed too soon, and whose return I deeply longed for. To set out to refine such a valued experience is usually a mistake, though an understandable one, or so I was advised by a meditation teacher I knew. Better, it would seem, is to approach meditation and our spiritual aspirations in general very much as the British psychoanalyst Wilfred Bion recommended we approach our patients. That is, quote, without memory, desire, or understanding, unquote. For memory involves the past, desire involves the future, and understanding in Bion's framework involves ideas while mindfulness aims for a quality of attention that is non-conceptual and focused as much as possible on the here and now. In my own practice of meditation that's anchored in a focus on the breath, 
I have found it useful to cultivate a stance I describe as waiting in the silence or listening in the silence. Such a stance allows me intermittently to rest in awareness, to, as it were, be awareness rather than the thoughts, feelings, sensation that, sensations that come and go as the objects of awareness. In such a stance, I am often at the edge of the unknown, ready to notice whatever next arises and then to attend once more to the breath, to awareness, to waiting. Like much of the rest of my life, the book I'd been writing on attachment and psychotherapy was changed by my experience on the deck, which compelled me to attend to the whole matter of mindfulness. The book had been organized around three key findings of attachment research, findings that highlighted the centrality of the relationship, the nonverbal dimension, and the stance of the self toward experience. With regard to the latter, it was the capacity for what attachment researchers call a mentalizing, a reflective stance that was seen to be significant. Such a stance allows us to interpret, to make sense of our own and others' behavior and experience in light of underlying mental states, such as feelings, uh, thoughts, uh, beliefs, uh, intentions, and so forth. This ability to read minds is an invaluable resource for all of us, but especially parents and therapists, invaluable because it helps us to regulate our emotions and to experience both insight into ourselves and empathy for others. No less valuable, however, is the ability to be mindful, for mindfulness, too, promotes affect regulation, insight, and empathy. In the book, I would eventually describe mentalizing and mindfulness as, quote, the double helix of psychological liberation, unquote, the first frees us through understanding, the second through acceptance, presence, and awareness. To which I would now add that the mindful dimension, which I initially came to through my, quote, awareness of awareness, unquote, and my experience of no self, can be a spiritual as well as a psychological dimension. For it does seem to connect us, at least potentially, to a mysterious something that is, to borrow Pargament's three descriptors of the sacred, quote, transcendent, boundless, and ultimate. So having sketched the trajectory from, you know, the Jewish boy and young man uh, to and through an interest in mindfulness and meditation and that sense of a, a spiritual something, uh, I'm going to talk now about working with suffering. Suffering and the urge to heal it is threaded through my own Jewish experience and the history of the Jews. In Buddhism, suffering is regarded as the primary fact and challenge of life. Perhaps for therapists in particular, suffering is the heart of the matter. It's what brings our patients to therapy. And from the other side of the couch, it's usually our own suffering that brings us to the work of therapy as a calling and as a hope. It's my theory, but not mine alone. I think in particular of Michael Sussman's work. Michael is, a, I believe, a Boston therapist, right? I think so. So I, I think of Sussman's work. Uh, which proposes that therapists are called rather than made. In other words, it's who we are and who we hope to become that draws us to the work. Moreover, it is who we are and who we can become that ultimately determines our capacity to, cre to create relationships with our patients that are genuinely therapeutic. Very much as the psychology of parents determines their capacity to raise secure kids, it is our own psychology that shapes our ability to raise secure patients. This psychology is originally shaped, of course, in the context of our first attachment relationships. But as the organizers of this conference know, therapists are also shaped by religious and spiritual experiences and values. These experiences and values can support adaptive, progressive, and reparative trends in the personality and conduct of the therapist, but they can also reinforce trends that are problematic. 
my own personality and my conduct as a therapist were shaped most profoundly in the context of my relationship with my mother. Sketched in broad strokes, the influence of this relationship was reinforced by my Jewishness and softened by my, quote, Buddhism, unquote. So now for the details, and a bit later, some clinical material that illustrates the points I'll be making. So I, I you know, this is a paper, and I, I, I like to call this section, if it's not one thing, it's your mother. <laughs> when my mother was in her early 80s, I tried to tape record an interview with her, an oral history. I thought this would have meaning for her, for me, and for my children. I began by asking her to tell me something about her growing up in Chicago. She broke a very long silence by speaking in an odd and unfamiliar, halting and disorganized way about the stink of urine in the halls of the tenement where her family lived and about the chaos there, the noise and the crazy people. Then she became tearful, completely unable to speak. Sounds familiar. I quickly backed off in the face of what I intuitively recognized as her history of unresolved trauma. Perhaps this history had roots in the trauma of my grandmother, who as a teenager in 1905 had fled the murderous anti-Jewish pogroms of Tsarist Russia. Per my mother, her own mother was a tyrannical, in her words, monster, who drove her mercilessly to succeed. I only know that my mother was once a brilliant, beautiful, and vivid woman who had been a child prodigy pianist under her mother's thumb, who stopped playing the moment she left home to attend the University of Chicago on a scholarship. Our relationship had multiple facets, many of them positive, but most influential perhaps was my mother's vicious alcoholic rage and my need to manage it. I did so in various ways. I took on her view of me as a monster. I apologized abjectly for whatever triggered her rage. Most of all, I tried to read her so as to be able to behave in ways that might somehow avert or diminish the rage. Mainly what I read in her was a need never to feel abandoned, so I suppressed every sign of my separateness, and never to feel the shame of her own neediness. So I tried always to satisfy her needs before they could be shamefully exposed, while simultaneously internalizing the shame that she disowned. In the role of her confidant, I empathized with her experience and provided the attuned re emotional responsiveness I felt my father was incapable of. When I wasn't her victim, I was her perfect son, her surrogate husband, her idealized object. I felt I was the chosen one, but also vic uh, viciously persecuted. That sounds familiar. My father watched all of this unfold without a word. Appearing cowed by her and passive, he modeled a certain kind of victimhood. On the other hand, he was also a profoundly decent man who, according to my mother, raised me until I could talk to her. So here's the, the Jewish strand again. I, I'd like to call this my first clinical placement. Therapists. <laughs> Therapists to be usually receive their earliest clinical training in the context of relationships not dissimilar from the one I've just described with my mother. Often, it seems to me, our history involves trauma at the hands of traumatized parents to whom we adapt with what attachment researchers call a controlling caregiving strategy. That is, we learn to take charge of scary parents by taking care of them. This provides an education in many essential clinical, uh, clinical skills, interactive active affect regulation, reading nonverbal cues, and the like, while also building in certain countertransference vulnerabilities. What I took from the family practicum described above was reinforced both for better and for worse by growing up Jewish. On the plus side, Jews are interpreters, or in the contemporary parlance, we mentalize. Psychoanalysis has been called the, quote, Jewish science, unquote, partly because Freud and most of the pioneering analysts were Jewish, but more meaningfully, I believe, because Freud's essentially interpretive method can be seen to extend a centuries-long Jewish tradition of interpreting holy texts. Rabbis and their students, rather than taking the Talmud's words at face value, enlisted multiple interpretive technologies to discern God's intent beyond the literal meaning of the text. Similarly, Freud treated his patients' symptoms and dreams as texts 
to be interpreted. And because problematic mental phenomena were, in Freud's words, overdetermined, multiple interpretations were required to free patients from the grip of their internal world. Mentalizing, according to Fonagy, essentially involves the generating of multiple perspectives on experience and behavior rather than being trapped in the, quote, reality, unquote, of one view. This is why mentalizing, especially the two-person mentalizing that occurs in therapy, can be affect regulating, can create mental space, can liberate. I like to think that my own mentalizing capability, my own interpretive imagination arose at least partly in the relationship I had with each of my parents, for at their best, both conveyed the sense that behavior, mine, that of their friends, that of characters in novels, but rarely their own, had meaning and was the product of motivations that could only be inferred or interpreted. Early on, I absorbed the idea that what one saw on the surface was often merely appearance. The essential reality was complex and lay within. In keeping with Jewish culture, my parents also conveyed to me that feelings mattered a lot. In keeping with the religion and the culture, they conveyed that other people mattered and that we were called upon to consider the well-being of all. In the words of the Old Testament prophet Micah, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with God. Not so positively. My impressions of Jewish history, and especially my early exposure to the Eichmann trial and to Holocaust literature, converged with the most painful features of my family experience in a way that reinforced my original sense that my role was to suffer. This suffering seemed, this suffering seemed a legacy and a burden but also a source of good feeling about myself. It strengthened a sense of moral superiority, and because I had the ability to endure what I felt would destroy others, it supported what a friend of mine <laughs> referred to as a kind of, quote, Jewish macho, unquote. <laughs> Obviously, all this contributed to my disturbing identif identification with the Lamed Vavnik in the novel The Last of the Just. And it was also consistent with my role in relation to my mother, which was to absorb and thus manage her anger. Out of my fear of her, no doubt, but also out of a sense that I could tolerate suffering better than she and that my own anger would destroy her. The grip of this identification with suffering and the fear of imposing suffering on others has diminished as I've come to understand and work with it in my own therapy and analysis. Nonetheless, it has been and remains intermittently a vulnerability. I recognize it in my tendency at times to simply vicariously experience and endure the pain of my patients, when the alternative might be to explore, confront, deepen, or attempt to bring my own understanding to that pain. Particularly in the past, I've noticed myself stopping myself out of fear that my intervention would be too painful for a particular patient to bear or as if I then might experience myself as the victimizer rather than the rescuer or victim. Of course, inhibiting myself to, quote, protect, unquote, the patient diminished my capacity to help. And on occasion, the surplus inhibition eventuated in an explosion, you know, from my side, that was destructive in a couple of instances and unexpectedly productive in a number of others. Perhaps needless to say, what I'm describing here is my idiosyncratic drift toward particular kinds of enactments, those you know, transference, counter-transference enactments, those mini psychodramas that constantly unfold where the attachment patterns and core vulnerabilities of therapist interact with those of patient. Unrecognized, these enactments function like an invisible straitjacket. Once recognized, they can become the single most powerful means for transforming obstacles in the therapeutic relationship into opportunities for insight, inspiration, and change. As I'm about to explain, a stance of mindfulness is extraordinarily well suited to recognizing our participation in enactments because mindfulness involves being aware of what we're doing while we're doing it. And so I think here of the Jewish poet, Bob Dylan, uh, who, who writes, some people feel the rain, other people just get wet. Okay, um, and now the Buddhist strand, which I, I, I like to call, there must be some kind of way out of here, also quoting the, uh, the poet. <laughs> 
When I put question mark, a quote, this is in the paper, of course, when I put quotation marks around the word Buddhist, uh, it's because I'm using that word in an informal, descriptive, and very personal way to suggest the nature of my own experience of spirituality, which is exactly that, my own. And my spirituality, my sense of a mysterious something that's transcendent, boundless, and ultimate, going back to pargament, mainly goes back to three related matters. The first is my awareness of the impersonal awareness that seems to lie at the very center of all sentient beings and that seems to go on being, you know, before I'm born, after I'm born, or as George, the George Harrison song puts it, it's within you and without you. Within you and without you. Uh, second uh, is my experience of connection to and compassion for others, rooted in the fact that all of us sentient and suffering beings are, in the sense I just alluded to, essentially one and the same. Third is my understanding of the vital importance of the present moment that Thich Nhat Hanh identifies as the doorway to heaven on earth. Just as growing up Jewish conferred both strengths and vulnerabilities, waking up to mindfulness has strengthened my work as a therapist in many ways, but doubtless created an additional vulnerability or two as well. In the plus column, and this is the far more significant, mindfulness exercised in meditation and elsewhere has vastly heightened my ability to be present and my conviction that this matter, this whole matter of presence is at the very heart of a life well lived. Sitting with a patient yesterday, actually last week now, I felt a sadness in myself that turned out to be an arrow pointing in the direction of his buried sadness in realizing that he was just going through the motions, absent rather than present for the living of his own life. Mindfulness and meditation have also deepened my sense of the ways in which the, the mind mediates our experience of the world, either creating surplus suffering or diminishing it. Of vital importance for me is the understanding born of experience that suffering is usually amplified to the extent that we identify with the suffering itself rather than with the awareness which notices the suffering. It, I just read this terrific quote yesterday from Thich Nhat Hanh. He writes, it is your right to suffer. It is not your right not to practice when you suffer. You know, practice mindfulness. Um, so, uh, of vital importance for me is the understanding born of experience that suffering is usually amplified to the extent that we identify with the suffering itself rather than, than the awareness which notices the suffering. When we are aware of awareness, when we can locate our awareness and rest there, we often find a world of unexpected calm to which we may potentially have access. In meditation and elsewhere, I've also come to recognize how suffering can be amplified by our attempts to avoid it. Paul Fulton writes, mindfulness offers a way to change our relationship to suffering by surrendering our need to reject it. This is an act of kindness to oneself. Together, these developments have loosened the grip of my own identification with suffering and my attachment to the controlling caregiving strategy I initially adopted to protect myself from my mother's rage, but later tended to repeat in other relationships, including those with my patients. Feeling more present now means that the past I know and the future I imagine can be more easily sheared away, so to speak, so that in the moment I can relate to my patients with greater freedom. Specifically, I don't feel compelled, as I did with my mother, to do anything and everything possible to help my patients avoid their suffering. Similarly liberating is my understanding that their suffering has a lot to do with automatic, history-driven patterns of thinking, feeling, and doing that can neither be illuminated nor transformed so long as I meet those patterns with my own automatic, history-driven pattern of compulsive caregiving. As for the minus side, you know, what's not to like about mindfulness? Uh, I've noticed a few things. 
First, there's my tendency at times to collude with patients who are themselves on a spiritual path that parallels my own. How might this look? Cheerleading is one descriptor that comes to mind. Mutual admiration society is another. Second, I can be guilty on rare occasions of a kind of what's called spiritual bypass in which my own no doubt overdetermined disidentification with suffering is has me encouraging the patient to somehow disidentify with her own suffering rather than feel it, share it, make sense of it, and thus begin to work it through. And third, I've annoyed at least one patient by too enthusiastically advocating med meditation, which struck her as my confusing a personal with a universal solution, assuming that's worked for me would necessarily work as well for her. So finally, the clinical material. For a number of years, I've worked with a delightful but anxious and easily overwhelmed woman patient in her early 50s whom I'll call Leslie. The treatment was initiated by Leslie's mother, who felt that her daughter, now facing the stress of caring for two ailing parents, could use the support of a therapist. My own sense was that despite Leslie's acute and deeply thoughtful sensibility, she was not in full possession of her own rather eloquent voice. She seemed, in fact, uncertain about her right to a life of her own. In summarizing my work with this patient, my aim is to illustrate by example how our conduct as, therapist, as therapists can be affected both for better and for worse by our personal history, including the history of our religious and spiritual experiences. As I've, as I've emphasized, my own experiences of growing up Jewish with an Orthodox grandfather, secular parents, and a profoundly disturbing early exposure to the details of the Holocaust converged with traumatic aspects of my relationship with my mother to generate not only a commitment to healing, but also an identification with the role of the sufferer and a dread of imposing suffering. Years of analysis and therapy and a good marriage have softened this identification and diminished the dread, but perhaps in addition I also needed what I got, the grace of the profoundly transformative experience I've described and the meditative practice and perspective on mindfulness for which it was the catalyst. Like my own history, Leslie's bore the scars of trauma. She was raised in the shadow of, of a brilliant and charismatic father who was also profoundly narcissistic, controlling, denigrating, and sexually intrusive. As a child, he had been a musical prodigy. As a parent, he expected no less of his daughter, going so far as to contemplate a surgery upon Leslie's hands when they seemed too small for her to succeed as a concert pianist. Recently, she wrote me the following in an email. Yesterday in session, you gave me the answer to the puzzle which has confounded me all my life about my relationship with my father. You said that with extreme narcissists, there's often an impersonal quality even when they are being generous. This exactly named the quality I'd been searching to express or even formulate in my mind. It encompasses all the paradoxes. While providing for my material needs, I felt little sympathy and more often his anger at me for falling short of his expectations, his mentally turning the tables so quickly that my efforts to express myself were seen as rank disloyalties to him, and I would simply become confused and fall silent. His wit often masking a lack of connection and warmth, his anger and impatience resulting in my self-doubt and insecurity about my own motives and worth. I had suspected the narcissism, but the word impersonal was what opened my eyes. A parent who demands unquestioning loyalty but dispenses impersonal affection or sympathy forever relegates the child to a dependent and inferior role. That is the mindfuck children don't understand. Instead, they think they are the deficient ones. Leslie saw her father as almost a force of nature against whose cruelties her mother was helpless to protect her. The oasis in this emotional desert was Leslie's younger brother, with whom she feels she shared a bond of nearly perfect trust and understanding. Early in our therapy, 
She told me in an oddly matter-of-fact way that when she was in her early 20s, her beloved brother had been killed in an automobile accident in which the driver of the car, who had fallen asleep at the wheel, escaped unscathed. When I inquired about the details, she was reticent, and I quickly understood that I was being warned away from the memories of a loss too traumatic to address. Over the course of a couple of years, we dealt with a variety of stresses in Leslie's current life and revisited many aspects of her history. You might say, I wouldn't disagree, that we were, quote, building a relationship, unquote. I'm sure that Leslie felt supported by my efforts to know, understand, and be of help to her as we explored her marriage, her relationship past and present with her mother and her father, her truncated career as an artist, and the suicide some years before of her closest friend. From my side, I was, for the most part, deeply engaged by Leslie's efforts to make sense of her experience. I also recognized the overlap in our experiences growing up and a connection between us grounded in, among other things, the passion we shared for music and books. At a certain point, however, I began to feel vaguely discontented with our work. With the benefit of hindsight, I can now see that we were at an impasse. To put it much too simply, I was playing out with Leslie a familiar pattern, in a certain sense, a memory in which I felt I was taking care of someone by helping to diminish their suffering, not by confronting the suffering at its source, but rather by providing the balm of a soothing, if only superficially, healing relationship. From another angle, I was refusing to be the one to impose suffering. Referring to my own religious identity, it was as if I was refusing to be the Nazi, the monster, preferring instead to be, if you will, a nice Jewish boy. And this, of course, suited Leslie, who was, I believe, convinced that she was utterly incapable of confronting the double trauma of her father's abuse and her brother's death. When dealing with trauma, patient, with dealing with traumatized patients, therapists with their own history of trauma are both burdened and blessed. We are blessed because we have the potential for deep understanding based on our partial identification with our patients. We are burdened because our history and our adaptation to trauma through a controlling caregiving strategy can function like an invisible straitjacket, constraining our ability to move in ways that might be therapeutic. My freedom of movement with Leslie was restored, as it has been with many other patients of mine, through what might be called mindfulness in action. The aim here is to bring to the interaction with the patient the same bare attention that we bring to our experience when we meditate. There, the aim is simply to be aware of and to label our experience in the present moment. The way I operationalize this in the treatment setting is simply to ask myself, what am I actually doing now with this particular patient? Sitting with Leslie in the session in question, I became aware that I was doing a number of things. I was aware that I was enjoying looking at her and then listening to her talk about feeling overwhelmed and taking some medication. I was aware that I was, standing, that I was staying on the surface, automatically conveying my empathy, in quotes, and understanding, in, in quotes, but making no attempt to have her deepen her experience or elaborate upon it. I was aware of feeling that I was going through the motions. Looking more searching, searchingly at my moment-to-moment -moment experience with Leslie, I was disturbed to recognize the sense in myself that I was giving up on her, as if I'd become convinced she was simply incapable of feeling or thinking more deeply. Mindfulness of this kind makes room for the therapist's experience, then we need to enlist our mentalizing capacity in order to make sense of that experience. Beyond the key question, what am I actually doing with this patient, we need to ask two others aimed at deepening our understanding. What is the implicit relational meaning of what I'm doing? And what might be my motivations for doing what I'm doing? As for the implicit meaning of my conduct with Leslie, I could see it from several angles. Closest to consciousness was my sense that I was protecting her from the impact of experience I too readily assumed she could not bear. 
At a deeper level, I saw that I was inadvertently ratifying her sense of her own fragility by colluding with her fear that should she try and confront her trauma, it would sink her. As for my motivations, I was aware of at least two. First, to push her to address her trauma would raise the specter of seeing myself and or being seen by her as the monster who imposes rather than relieves dreadful and irredeemable suffering. Second and relatedly, I was fearful of the shame in her and in me that might be exposed were we to explore the details of her trauma. For it seems virtually inevitable to me that among the many unlovely consequences of being in the receiving end of trauma is the experience of nearly unbearable shame. The feeling not that one has done something bad, but that one is bad. No coincidence, I presume, but in the, session, in the session following the one I've just touched on, Leslie gave me an opening to begin to resolve the impasse that had gripped us. In reading the neuroscientist Joseph Ledoux, she told me, she'd come across the idea that emotions can trump reason, but that emotions can be controlled with a poker face. It's a paradox of her own experience, she says, that she studiously avoids stuff like scary movies that might evoke strong feelings, but still, she's very mercurial, as a friend put it, in describing her. That is, small stuff evokes big feelings. I say to her that to me, these things really seem to go together. When people have suffered trauma, they're vulnerable. They've got an exaggerated startle reaction and they deal with their vulnerability in different ways. She by staying away from stuff like scary movies. I also say that staying away from scary movies is a low cost solution, but she's needed to make use of this pattern of staying away from scary stuff more broadly and maybe the costs here are higher. Leslie says, like with my husband? where I didn't let myself feel my anger and hurt? Yeah, I reply, but also more broadly. I guess I'm thinking about how we've stayed away from stuff here. Looking a little deer in the headlights-ish, she says, I'm not sure what you mean. Well, your brother's death, your experiences with your dad, and then Leslie adds, maybe Joseph's suicide? I think so, but you know, it takes two to tango. I think I've sort of gone along with the idea that maybe this stuff is just too big and painful for the two of us to approach. Leslie responds that she's been in lots of therapy and thinks she's decided that she simply can't approach this stuff. She tells me that one of her previous therapists had quoted Freud to the effect that we never want to take away what's allowed people to maintain their equilibrium. Of course, I respond, you don't want, and I don't want, you to drown in your painful feelings. But I think people are often capable of knowing more and feeling more than they think they are. And I think I've sort of gone along with this idea, which I'm feeling more and more may not be true or useful, that you can't do any more here than you're doing, that you can't and we can't. And maybe that doesn't serve you. And now I tell her our session's nearly over, but add, I'm guessing we're beginning a conversation here, not ending one. Apparently she agrees. Not long after the session, I get an email from her asking if it might be possible to meet again later in the day. She writes, somehow a chord was struck in the course of our conversation, which has returned that old sensation of having a stone on my heart, which I can't seem to wish away. When we met later that afternoon, she told me with barely suppressed tears that for more than 30 years, she has sustained herself with the belief that her brother is not actually dead, but is residing on the East Coast. Twice, she had in fact seen him after his death, an apparition standing tall at 18 years old, looking forbidding and even angry. Why these should have been the emotions on his face, she could not understand, but it, it grieved her. Much later, she told me, 
that when feeling completely distraught at his death, she had cried, it should have been me. But apparently her grief and guilt had all been kept, as she put it, in cold storage, so long as she had been able to believe that her brother was still alive. As an update on this still ongoing, ongoing therapy, I'll offer an email that Leslie sent to me in June. She wrote, as a patient of yours, I think I can say that I've progressed in ways I never could have anticipated when I started. I think this has to do with the feeling I have that I can finally express myself freely. You've certainly encouraged that. And that much of what I say, you understand intuitively, having a similar family history in important ways. In my case, it seems that the therapeutic value has stemmed from my desire to think of you as a friend and brother. The hard part was giving up the illusion that my own brother and I would somehow meet again someday. He was gone so suddenly that I simply couldn't embrace that reality. When I was forced, albeit gently, to realize that, I felt such pain that I thought I would be, it would be better for me to stop therapy. Though I didn't tell you this because I wasn't sure what to do. Just as I relied on my brother's support and our shared history, I seem to have relied on you to keep alive that shared relationship which was so important to me while enduring my father's abuse. Leslie was one of the patients who saw Pargament's book on psychotherapy and spirituality sitting on a table beside my chair in the office where I work. Seeing the book sparked a conversation in which she told me that her own belief in God had instantly been extinguished when she learned that her brother had been killed. She simply could not sustain faith in a deity who would allow such tragedy and suffering to occur. But she was aware of the comfort and meaning that her mother and some of her, and some of her friends derived from their faith and she wished that she too could somehow believe. For myself, an unbeliever in a conventional personal God, I am sustained by my participation in the culture and traditions of the Jewish people, these are my roots, and by my newly acquired Buddhist spirituality. And I very much appreciate the fact that this spirituality is grounded in experience rather than belief in practice rather than faith. As a modestly scholarly, always questioning Jewish therapist, that's a spirituality that suits me. So thank you very much. <laughs>